The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. You've logged on to the Nelson Labs, webinar, Nelson Labs webinar, Skincare Products, Understanding Test Solutions. Now, if you miss one of our webinars or would simply like to refer to one, you can always find them on the Nelson Labs website on the on-demand webinars page listed under education. You can receive notifications of upcoming live and on-demand webinars by liking Nelson Labs on Facebook or following us on Twitter or LinkedIn. We also invite you to register for free for the Soterra Health Academy at soterrahealth.com forward slash academy. There, you'll find curated content from industry thought leaders, from introductory sterilization and lab testing topics to advanced, in-depth learnings. Our expert advisors have filled this academy with cutting-edge educational content and resources to help you mitigate risk, go to market faster, and achieve excellence in your field. Nelson Labs is a leading global provider of laboratory testing and expert advisory services for healthcare, consumer, med tech, and pharmaceutical companies. The company performs over 800 rigorous microbiological and analytical laboratory tests across the medical device, pharmaceutical, and consumer, consumer industries. The experts at Nelson know that every test matters and requires solutions to complex problems to improve patient outcomes and minimize client risk. Now, let's get started. Today, we're joined by Christopher Bosleil. Chris has worked at Nelson Labs Bozeman, formerly known as Bioscience Laboratories, since 1994. He has been involved in all phases of testing, from proof of concept and R&D studies to regulatory evaluations for FDA 510K submissions. As a primary department scientist for the clinical research team, he is the main resource for sponsors looking to conduct clinical studies of any complexity. His experience focuses on evaluating the efficacy and safety of products using both FDA um, recognized methods and custom, and custom protocols. We do encourage your questions. Please submit them at any time in the question box. Chris will try to answer as many as he can in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar. And now beginning today's presentation, I turn the time over to Chris. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, I look forward to uh, presenting skincare products, understanding testing options. Uh, first, a little bit of background about our facility. Uh, in Bozeman, Montana. Um, for over 30 years, NLB has been developing protocols and test procedures for evaluating the effect of topically applied products. Uh, originally, uh, our scope of our studies were focused primarily on evaluating antimicrobial efficacy with healthy human subjects. Um, that topically applied pr disinfectant products must be proven to not only be efficacious, but also be safe to use. So it was natural for us to uh, expand the scope of our studies to evaluate these products, not only for their efficacy, but also for their safe use. Uh, over the years, uh, we've developed numerous protocols and procedures for establishing the efficacy, safety, or both of a product. Now, in this pre presentation, I'll be presenting a couple of test methods that we've developed over, these over this time period. First, uh, regulatory considerations, uh, that itself could be its own extensive webinar series. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail about all the regulatory considerations everyone must consider, but uh, all manufacturers must be cognizant of the regulations where they intend to market their product. Uh, regulatory authorities around the world have requirements for both drugs and cosmetics. Uh, those products must be demonstrably safe for use and be effective in their defined function. So they, you must be able to demonstrate that the products are doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're doing it safely. Now, for this presentation, we're looking at the skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body. It presents a barrier protecting the internal systems from bacterial, viral, and fungal invasion. It has a critical role in maintaining thermal regulation and water balance, and is also a fragile sense organ. Uh, the anatomy of this, for the anatomy of skin, we have basically have three areas or three regions. You have your epidermis, your dermis, and your hypodermis. Uh, in this diagram, you can see the various vascular components of the dermis, such as the hair follicles, the sensory nerves, the sebaceous glands, the sweat glands, uh, rectal pili, your uh, goosebump muscle. 
the dermis also is composed of our other cell types too, which are important for immunological response and structure. Uh, the dermis is protected by an overlying tough keratinized epidermal covering called the epidermis. Now the epidermis is a multi-level component of the skin consisting of live active cells at the basal level, which progress outward undergoing keratinization or a flattening and hardening forming squames or corneocytes that ultimately flake off. Uh, the spaces between these squames, corneocytes, are filled with multiple lipid bilayers, which aid in maintaining impermeability of the stratum corneum to many compounds, including water. Uh, skin care products may have an effect on its outer level. That effect may be to improve the integrity of the epidermis. Another effect may be adverse and may compromise the integrity of the epidermis, resulting in drying, cracking of the skin, potentially exposing the lower levels with the live tissues uh, to the environment. Uh, some skincare products may also contain ingredients that can penetrate the epidermis, epidermis to the dermis, eliciting an immunological or irritant response. Okay. Some basic test method examples we've developed are uh, simulated or exaggerated use evaluations, a controlled application technique uh, evaluation, and a split face evaluation. For our simulator exaggerated use studies, uh, we use healthy human subjects. Um, studies are usually composed of mixed or single sex. They have various ages. Uh, they could also have mixed or limited demographics. Uh, we typically perform these with 20 plus subjects. Subjects uh, will just use a single product. Uh, that single product is used either once or multiple uses over a single day, multiple days or multiple weeks. Uh, we can evaluate cleansing products, creams, moisturizer, ointments, anything that's used uh, daily. Uh, evaluations are performed at any time following a single application or multiple applications. Uh, we have visual evaluators, you have visual evaluators uh, trained to evaluate the skin uh, for dryness, erythema, redness, rashes, uh, any kind of reactions. Uh, we also use uh, bioinstrumentation measurements to uh, measure uh, skin conditions. Uh, for this type of study, you can also have subjective use questionnaires where you have query the subjects for their likes, dislikes about a product and certain attributes that you're interested in. Uh, for these types of studies, we've used these couple examples. We've used these for uh, healthcare personal hand wash products, products used by healthcare personnel daily, multiple times within a day between subjects. Uh, uh, We've evaluated these products to see if they have a, improved the skin over multiple applications or if they have a deleterious effect on the skin. Uh, subjects will perform multiple hand washes over multiple days with evaluations performed throughout those days. Uh, we've also used these studies for body wash products. Uh, subjects will take these home, products home. Uh, they'll use it for daily washing and then return at certain intervals for evaluations and completing questionnaires to rate their experiences with the products. Another type of study that we've used is a controlled application technique. Uh, this can be performed in two areas of the body. Uh, this is, we have what we call the LCAT or lower leg controlled application technique procedure or the forearm controlled application technique, the FCAT. Uh, these studies again are performed with healthy human subjects. They may be of mixed or single sex, various ages or mixed or single demographics. Uh, can do these, typically we perform these with 20 plus subjects. Uh, one advantage of this is we can use a multiple products on a single subject. Uh, for these multiple products, we can look at four wash type products or eight lotion type products. Here you can use on the lower leg, we divide the area up into quadrants. So, so we have an upper and lower part of this leg of the right leg and lower upper and lower part of the left leg. Uh, we'd have the applications are performed by analysts in the lab. So every product is applied the same way or according to a procedure. Uh, so it's a controlled application. Uh, for the arm, we use the volar forearm and can, uh, we can apply wash products either to the upper and lower half or if we were to do, if we were to look at uh, waterless products or lotion type products, we can actually split these areas up into smaller areas and use smaller areas of skin and evaluate a lot more products. Uh, one main advantage of this, you can 
incorporate control and comparative products into this study. So you can actually see a direct comparison of how your product compares to a control on the same subject. So you actually get to see that. So you don't have subject to subject variability. You have the, everything is done on the same subject. Uh, we can look at single product use, or we can look at multiple uses over single day, multiple day, or multiple weeks uh, with subjects returning for these applications and, and uh, evaluations. Uh, we've done these with cleansing products, creams, moisturizer, ointments, uh, anything intended for use on the skin. Uh, these evaluations can be formed at any time following single or multiple applications. Uh, visual evaluations, again, are performed by trained evaluator looking for any kind of dryness, a drying effect, erythema, or any kind of irritant reactions. And we use value instrumentations to measure other skin conditions as well. Third type uh, that we've used is a split face study. These are products intended for use on the face. Um, we use uh, healthy human subjects again for this study. Uh, they may be of mixed or single sex, various ages, or mixed or single demographics. Again, a lot of our, most of our studies, we recommend 20 plus subjects in order to get some kind of, uh, in order to have some data that provides or allows us to prove that there's some kind of an effect going on. Uh, for this study, you can use up to two products used on a subject by an analyst or by a subject. Uh, the applications performed by an analyst or subject use standardized application procedure in a laboratory setting are used by subjects at home. Uh, you can use uh, for the other side of the face, you can use a controller compare product. So again, as with the controlled application technique, you can see how your product compares to uh, another product or no product use. Uh, you can have this after a single product application, mul multiple days or multiple weeks. Uh, you can look at uh, cleansing products, for creams, moisturizers, ointments. Uh, Valuation is performed at any time following the application, uh, following a single or multiple applications. Again, you have visual eva evaluators look at the skin for any kind of evidence of any kind of uh, dryness, erythema, cracking, irritation. And you can, you can use bioinstrumentation to measure other skin conditions as well. Now, examples of, let's not go back to the other one, the controlled application. I mean, we've used these for uh, looking at skin moisturizers. Uh, we can actually, with a skin moisturizer, since the water application, we can use multiple moisturizers. Uh, we can use look at competitors or a whole product line. Uh, we can look at the immediate and continued effects. Uh, since we use all the products on the same subject, this allows for better statistical analysis and comparison. Uh, and evaluations are performed immediately or at multiple times. Uh, this can allow us to map the moisturizing effect over a period of time. Uh, we've also used these studies for body wash products. Uh, we can, again, look at multiple formulations of a product line. Uh, if you want to know, determine which one's better tolerated or which one has the most beneficial effect on the skin. Uh, we've done these studies with all male subjects, with all female subjects, with mixed, gen mixed sex. Um, Washes are controlled, so they're all performed the same. Uh, all products used on the same subject, again, allows for better statistics. And the subjects return for multiple washes and evaluation determine immediate and continued use effects. Uh, for the split face study, uh, we've done two types of these. We've done the ones where we do the controlled application in lab, uh, where we have a comparison on one side of the face or uh, we do a comparison to a controller or a competitor on one side of the face and the other face has uh, the test product. Again, we've looked at these with single sex or mixed sex. Uh, certain age groups, we've actually blocked this by age groups as well. Uh, the applications are controlled, so all the are controlled and performed by analysts in the lab. So every application is performed the same and uh, evaluations are performed immediately and after periods of time. Uh, for long-term studies, uh, we would, we've done these studies where we've uh, instructed, we've had subjects come in, we've instructed them on how to use the products on their skin and given them products, materials to apply the product and a diary to log their applications at home and have them use these products over a period of weeks, period of months and track their products effects on the skin uh, over that period of time. I've talked a lot about the bioinstrumentation 
that we use. And the reason we use it, it allows for an objective quantitative measurement of various skin conditions that may, may not be readily observed by a subject or evaluator. Uh, measurements of skin moisture content or loss. We perform measurements for skin moisture content or loss, skin pH, sebum, color, uh, physical appearance. Uh, for if you're using bioinstrumentation, subjects should be in a resting state. They should not be just coming in straight off the street, huffing and puffing, high blood, blood pumping, high blood pressure going. Uh, subjects have to be relaxed. Uh, and we usually do that by acclimation and temperature and humidity controlled lab prior to measuring. So we control, most of our lab studies are controlled at uh, about 70 degrees, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and between 30 and 40 uh, uh, percent relative humidity. Uh, this quantitative data, again, it allows for, for statistical significance testing. Uh, probably it's more robust and powerful than what you would get with a subjective evaluation. Now, types of instruments we use. One type, uh, we measure transepidermal water loss. We use our telemeter TM300 for this. Uh, this measures TWOL or transepidermal water loss rate of the skin via the density gradient of water evaporation from the skin indirectly. So we rest this probe head on the skin, water evaporates up through the device, and there's two probes within this device that measures that water loss. And this gives us a number actually measured in grams per hour per meter cubed. And then we can compare those numbers over a period of time. Uh, the higher rate may indicate damage to the ability of the skin to hold and maintain moisture. Uh, we have seen where you can actually see damage to the skin before, I mean, you can actually detect damage to the skin before you actually visually see the damage to the skin. So that higher rate might be indicative of the skin drying out. And then after that, you'd start to see the drying and cracking. Uh, for skin moisture content, we have two instruments that we use. One is the uh, corneometer, which measures the moisture content of the top 10 to 20 micrometers of the stratum corneum layer of the skin and uses capacitance. The other device we use is a Sky, SkyCon 200EX. And we have a high sensitive 8-pin MT8C probe that we use with this device. This measures moisture content of the skin of the stratum corneum level of the skin using high frequency conductance. So we all typically recommend using both these devices for measuring the skin because this gives us a pretty good measurement of moisture at the upper layers of the stratum corneum down through the lower layers of the stratum corneum. So we can get a pretty good picture of the skin moisture content of that whole layer. Uh, for skin color, we actually have our chromometer CR400. This actually measures color tone of the skin on three scales. So this gives us a quantitative number of what the skin looks like that we can use for an analysis. Uh, this measures it on three scales, black, white, red, green, and blue, yellow. Uh, this we've used for changes in skin color. We've used this to detect irritation or quantify irritation that you could visually see, but we can actually see it uh, increasing over time. We've also used this in vasoconstrictor assays or skin blanching studies. Now, one important device that we've used that's becoming more and more common in our studies is, us, is our uh, skin pH meter. Uh, we use the Hand Instruments Portable Waterproof Skin pH Meter. This measures skin pH. Uh, skin pH is important, pro is important for proper skin function. Uh, it can affect um, normal bacterial flora, and it also, and skin pH can be easily perturbed by the use of cleansers and other topical products. So we can look at how your product affects the pH of the skin and correlate that to one of the other devices to show that something's either improving or is not improving. Now for our facial studies, we have two devices that we use uh, in addition to the others, but one is the uh, sebum meter. This actually measures sebum. Sebum 
uh, plays an important role in proper skin. We have the and proper skin function. Uh, this measures the amount of hebum and the, on the scare, skin or hair uh, using grease spot photometry. Uh, this little device here has mat, ta mat tape on the end of it that we press up against the skin. And we've done these on the face studies where we'll look at certain areas around the eye, above the eye, uh, around the face. And you press that up there, it absorbs the sebum that's on the skin and you place that into this in, into the this device and there's a photo cell in there that'll actually measure the amount of sebum that was been that was taken up by the mat tape and we can actually track sebum production over a period of time uh, with product use without product use and see if there's any kind of effect that's uh, occurring with the sebum uh, production of the skin uh, another device that we have is the Vizia 2. This is a device that actually takes a picture or multiple pictures of the skin. Uh, subject would place their chin right here in the device and their forehead up here. And then there's multiple cameras in here, multiple light sources. This actually does visible light and UV light. And it'll take a picture and then the device itself will measure spots, pores, wrinkles, and skin texture. And we'll able to give us a quantitative data that we can use for analysis to see how your product affects uh, these uh, conditions. Now, one important thing to consider when doing uh, any kind of skin product testing is environmental conditions. Uh, as we all know, and we're probably experiencing right now, uh, low humidity and temperatures during the winter months lead to drier skin. Uh, we're probably all using moisturizers now more than we would typically do in uh, summer months. Uh, using a laboratory with a high dry climate is ideal for conducting skin moisturization studies. And the reason is that is that the skin is at a state where it can be, you can actually measure and an effect on, on the skin. If you're testing subjects in a high heat, high humidity area, they're always going to be sweating. There's always going to be moisture on the skin. It's going to be much more difficult to measure any kind of, to see if your product has any kind of effect on the skin. And if these products are being marketed during these winter, cold winter months, and that you want to show that, demonstrate that these products actually will moisturize the skin during this, uh, during this, during this time period. Uh, Bozeman is at uh, nearly 5,000 feet above sea level. They have very long winters and uh, rel low relative humidity. And this contributes to dry skin conditions throughout the year. Now, it, I went through and I was like trying for this presentation, I was trying to find a graph that shows how dry, just to visibly demonstrate how dry it actually is in Bozeman. And I found this graph and I was confused by this graph at first because I was like, okay, there's something wrong with this graph. There's no data on it. And then I saw this little word right here, dry. And it's just the humidity comes from over Bozeman from January to December. This is an average over the last few years. Uh, it, we've just, we're just dry. Uh, we do have some relief, but not much in June, July, August, but it's still relatively low. Uh, this dry environment is very important, again, as I said, for measuring effect on skin conditions. Um, we don't have to apply the product um, a bunch of times or numerous times in order to see an effect. We can apply a moisturizing lotion to what would be normal skin for our area and see how that affects, see if that actually increases the moisture content of the, of the skin. Uh, and again, if you were to perform these studies in a hot human environment, it, it would, it's, would be much more difficult to see that effect. And you're gonna have to do a lot more applications. You're gonna have to have a longer, your study's gonna have to go on for a longer period of time uh, versus if you do this in a dry, colder environment, you'll be able to see, get quicker results and see if your product's actually gonna have the effect that you want it to have on, on skin. Uh, that's it for my presentation. First, I'd like to uh, personally thank Samantha Comstock who took a lot of the pictures that you saw in this, uh, in, in this uh, presentation. I had her running around the lab and having people posing with those devices uh, so they can pre have them for this presentation. And uh, again, thank you all for attending and uh, I'll take any questions now. And if you have any questions later, you can actually use the, you can email me uh, at this email address. So thank you.
Chris, thank you so much for your insights. We all learned some great information today and you've given us a lot to think about. Um, we did receive some questions as you were speaking. Um, so yeah, we can go ahead and address those right now. Um, so that first question will be that for R&D studies, can you run smaller versions of the studies that you discussed today? Yes, yes, we definitely could. I mean, if you wanted to do a, narrow down a product line or something like that, uh, we would probably recommend the controlled application technique studies to where we can look at multiple products on, on uh, fewer subjects. And actually the data from that, since we're looking at the same types of at same subjects, we'd actually control the analysis by subjects. So we can actually see if that, determine if there's any kind of effect or whatever kind of effect you want us to look at on those subjects and maybe use that as a screening for a larger study or a screening for a product line or something like that. Yes. So yeah, definitely we could do smaller R and D studies and smaller investigations. And because we're in, again, like I was talking about the environment, uh, our subjects are perfectly conditioned, let's say, for looking at uh, effects of products on the skin. So we can definitely use a smaller, smaller sample size to get an indication of, of whether or not a product will do what you want it to do. Fantastic, thank you so much. The second question is, can you evaluate irritation and efficacy within the same study? Uh, again, that's how we first started in this industry. Our, our studies, our anti our efficacy testing, all of our studies have a safety component to them. So we're always evaluating, we're using the product on skin. So we're, while we're doing our efficacy study, we're actually evaluating the condition of the skin that we're applying products to. And out of that, we, from that experience, we were able to develop uh, these test methods that we have and use all these bio and irritations. And we can actually, we've definitely, we've all, we've definitely incorporated our uh, instrumentation and safety evaluations into our efficacy evaluations in the same study. So, yes. Fantastic, thank you for that answer. Um, I think we have time for one more question today. Um, before, I, before I ask that question, I just want to let everyone know if we didn't get to your question, um, please feel free to email Chris um, with the specific question and he would be happy to answer it um, in a more personal, personalized or direct manner. Um, but yeah, that last question will be, are the test methods that you discussed today, are they the same test methods used for dermatologist approved claims? We could, yes. And what we could do and what, what we do have available is we do have a dermatologist that we could either, that we consult with that can either be a principal investigator on these studies and perform the evaluation or as a sub investigator uh, as well, so that you can actually have a dermatolo dermatologi dermatologist evaluated study or approved study or claim. And also, we also have access to other physicians too, if we're looking at more health related claims too. Uh, but we do have physicians and dermatologists on staff available to be uh, for use on these studies if, if so needed. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Chris, so much for that thorough and informative presentation. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you so much for your insights. And I'd also like to thank you, the viewer, for attending this session. I hope you found it to be a valuable experience. Please be sure to visit us at nelsonlabs.com for more on-demand and live webinars like this one, or email us at experts at nelsonlabs.com for any specific testing questions that you may have, whether it is on this specific topic or any of our other services. Um, and with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.